On March 13, 1836, Texian scout Erastus D. Smith arrived in Gonzales with Susanna Dickinson in tow. She had been inside the Alamo throughout the 13-day siege and final assault during which her husband, Almiron, had died. While she confirmed reports that Tejano scouts had delivered two days before, General Houston could not conveniently lock her away. The Dickinsons were residents of Gonzales and had many friends and neighbors there. Accompanied by her infant daughter and Joe, William B. Travis's body servant, the widow Dickinson delivered a message from Antonio Lopez de Santana. All who opposed him would suffer the fate of the Alamo garrison. After learning of Mrs. Dickinson's ordeal, Houston, that hard drinking, loud swearing ah! frontier veteran, wept like a little boy. <laughs> News of the Alamo defeat stunned Texas. But nowhere was the grief greater than in Gonzales. There, the loss of life was intensely personal. Every family mourned the loss of a friend or relative. At least 20 women, many with small children, found themselves with them. John Sharp, a Texian officer, recalled the scene on the night of March 13th. For several hours after receipt of intelligence, not a sound was heard, save the wild shrieks of the woman and the heart-rending screams of the fatherless children. The terror in Gonzales spread throughout Texas. Even in Nacogdoches, far from the Mexican threat, residents convinced themselves that the Cherokees had allied with the enemy and were coming to massacre them. Frightened out of their wits, Anglo settlers fled in disorder toward the Sabine River. John A. Quitman recorded. The panic had done its work. The houses are all deserted. There are several thousands of women and children in the woods on both sides of the Sabine without supplies or money. Texians remembered the rush to the Louisiana border as the runaway scrape, the great runaway, or the Sabine shoot. Whatever they called it, the wild exodus was a nightmare of terror and suffering for the civilians. On April 15th, Quitman observed, we must have met at least 100 women and children, and everywhere along the road were wagons, furniture, and provisions abandoned. The capricious Texas weather contributed to the misery. The spring rains of 1836 were the heaviest in memory. Roads, still little more than trails, became quagmires. One of Houston's recruits, described conditions. Delicate women trudged from day to day until their shoes were literally worn out, then continued the journey with bare feet, lacerated and bleeding at almost every step. Their clothes were scant, and with no means of shelter from frequent drenching rains and bitter winds, they traveled on through the long days in wet and bedraggled apparel. The wet earth and angry sky offered no relief. One woman and her two small children rode a horse that bolted at a swollen creek and plummeted into the torrent. Horrified refugees on the opposite bank could only watch as the deadly current swept under horse mother, and youngster. Even when their operators worked around the clock, the few ferries could not accommodate the large volume of traffic. Delu Rose, a young girl at the time, recalled, Fully 5,000 people at Lynch's Ferry. 
Everyone was trying to cross first, and it was almost a riot. At many streams, women had to cross without the benefit of ferries. Settler S.F. Sparks recalled, The bottomlands were from a foot to a waist deep in water. The younger and stouter women would take the feeble ones on their backs and shoulders and wade through water to dry land, set them down, and go back for another load and continue until all were over. It seemed only natural that slaves would take advantage of the turmoil and escape. Certainly, contemporary accounts reveal that whites feared slave uprisings. Those same accounts, however, pay homage to those who stood by their masters. DeLue Rose recalled that while blacks outnumbered whites in her contingent, there was no insubordination among them. They were loyal to their owners. In one crisis, Uncle Ned, an elderly black man, took charge. He put white women and children in his wagon. It was large and had a canvas cover. The Negro women and children he put in open carts. Then he guarded the whole party till morning. Tejanos also took part in the Sabine shoot. Most were neutral, looking after their families and striving to keep out of harm's way until the storm subsided. But those married to Tejanos, known to have cooperated with rebellious Texians, had good reason to fear the wrath of Santana. Dee Smith's Tejana wife took to the road with her daughters because they were no longer safe in their San Antonio home. Neither was Josefa Seguin, wife of Erasmo and mother to Juan Seguin, she was the matriarch of one of Bayer's leading families. From the early days of Austin's first colony, she and her husband had been loyal friends of the Anglo settlers. During the 1835 siege of Bayer, the Seguins had supplied $4,000 worth of food and provisions to the insurgent army. The family paid for its friendship in 1836 when Santana's troops ransacked their ranch. Josefa and Erasmo fled northeastward with Texian civilians. Juan led a Tejano company in Houston's army. Following a long and perilous journey, during which Mexican soldiers appropriated most of their livestock, Doña Josefa and her family took refuge in San Augustine. The runaway scrape proved even harder on Tejanos than most. Escaping to the Anglo regions of East Texas, they entered a land that was geographically and culturally foreign to them, a land where few understood their language and where many despised them as greasers. The non-combatants endured dangers and hardships as harsh as those of the soldiers. The dearth of reliable records makes it impossible to know how many civilians fell victims to disease, mishaps, or exposure during the runaway scrape. But the number must have run into the hundreds. Texian Secretary of War Thomas Jefferson Rusk extolled the women who held their families together during the crisis. The men of Texas deserve much credit, but more was due of the women. Armed men facing a foe could not but be brave, but the women, with their little children around them, without means of defense or power to resist, faced danger and death with unflinching courage. The plight of civilian refugees, both angered and inspired the men of Houston's army. Wives and loved ones would lodge heavy in their minds as they prepared to unleash a full measure of revenge upon the Mexicans. <laughs>